this festival. Lola Lafon, uh, the composer, singer, and writer. Uh, her first love uh, was dance, but she later turned to writing. Lola is the author of several books, including the award-winning uh, La Petite Communiste qui ne souriait jamais, very recent translated, I think. And Nous sommes les oiseaux de la tempête qui s'annonce, uh, which was recently translated into English by Seagull Books as We Are the Birds of the Coming Storm. We Are the Birds of the Coming Storm is in uh, an insurrectionary and feminist tale told in poetic prose surrounding the Chicago Haymarket events which took place in the 19th century. Amy Schroeder uh, was the editorial director of the Feminist Press for six years. She also served as the editor-in-chief of Seven Stories Press, US publisher of Verso, co-editor of High Tourist Books, Serpent Stell, which she co-founded and editor at City Lights Books. Over the years, uh, she has published the work of many award-winning authors, such as uh, Karen Finlay, Kate Bernstein, Johnny Mitchell, Justin Vivian Bond, Virginie Despentes, and many others. Tonight, uh, the discussion will uh, reflect upon a line from We Are the Birds of the Coming Storm, where Lola states, I am beginning to realize that I am exiled from my sex, a voluntary exile, against the woman I should have been, the real life I should have led. Without further ado, here are Amy Schroeder on Nola Lafon. So, hello to everyone. I'm really glad to see such a full house of people. I'm very excited to be here in New York and to be able to, to read some pages of uh, We Are the Birds of the Coming Storm. And then to have a, a talk with Amy about several subjects, I think. So, um, maybe I'll start by reading a small page. Excuse me if uh, the reading is uh, so and so because uh, it's not my language. So, I'll try and do my best. So, this is one of the letters of the main character, which is called in the book The Little Girl Down the Lane, and she writes constantly. Vomit out what they're stuffing me with, their blueprint for life. Love department, work department, leisure department. When I question them, they enjoin me to consult a physician. They put me under instructions. They talk constantly to me of life. I recognize nothing that can sustain my body in their definition of life. I conclude from this that I'm not living in life. I'm beginning to realize that I'm exiled from my sex, a voluntary exile, in armed struggle, in resistance, against the woman I should have been, the real life I should have led, a life of round, clear, Fingernails, fully equipped kitchen, stretched out bellies ready to be emptied, sexes just moist enough ready to be spread apart, wooden spoons carefully drying in the dish rack, hair smooth with silicone. Of clever laughs and charming looks, overbooked early weekdays, ah, oh, it's so stressful, I'm running around all the time. Concern for your breath and panty bottoms, how to keep your underwear absolutely white. Vocal cords tamed down since adolescence, shouts and jumps in volume, corrected one by one. How vulgar. You're like a bulldozer. You're so brusque, they tell me. Exiled from that desire impaled in us to be bought, which goes so well with being hurt about not being bought. He didn't call me back. I don't want to join the herd, I don't want to lose myself, I don't want to forget myself, I don't want to be that doormat. I love myself as the girl I am, I want to be a grave jutting out over the sea. An ebony virgin is watching inside me, I want to be honest with her, writes Violet Le Duc. I'm so afraid that they'll take me back, that they'll snatch away my desire 
to wriggle out of my biological destiny. So that was the first thing. Hi everybody, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you um, for inviting me and Lola for um, uh, giving me this opportunity to get to know your work. Um, the new book is such a beautiful text and um, and it it was so fun to start thinking about our common interests uh, in feminism and in radical politics and um, in responses to gender violence. I think that's something I um, have been thinking a lot about um, as a literary kind of project, not to depict li gender violence as much as kind of the imagined um, responses to it um, that could be done literarily. It's perhaps a different um, uh, uh, ground for for that kind of thinking. Um, uh, we were riding up here in a cab and talking about um, um, well, there was something that struck me that you said about um, about feminism. We were talking about this. Um, I was at an event last night with a young feminist whose book I just published, um, and her work is about um, how the divisions um, now with younger kind of post-feminist these like women um, in who are feeling in a post-feminist world. Um, to my mind, and maybe in the way that their experience is, is now depicted often, um, is in fact just kind of returning to a reality that, that really has not um, addressed kind of the core feminist issues mm -hmm. around choice and equality and um, power. Um, and I, there was something you said to me, you said, yes, there are all of these divisions in feminism, and with those, because of these divisions, then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what you meant, I think I know, but I was really curious about the, the detail of what that meant, nothing happens. Well, um, as I told you in the cab, in fact, it, in France, um, I don't know how it is here, but in France, a lot of girls and women uh, resent the word feminism. And uh, when they agree to be called feminist, I mean, a lot of uh, journalists come to me and they say, um, would it be offensive to you if I say you're a feminist? I say, no, obviously <laughs> no. But it's really like an insult. And um, often, girls and women say, I'm a feminist, but, as they have to excuse themselves, so I'm a feminist, but still I love men, don't be, don't be afraid, uh, I'm not a castrator, uh, don't be afraid, I'm not a terrorist, uh, uh, I still put on lipstick, which I do with um, A lot of stuff like this, which proves that feminism in France is a um, uh, it's a difficult topic still. And um, I did a, something quite amazed me is that in most of the articles published about this book, and even of the latest, the journalist would start by saying she's blonde. She comes to the interview and she has blah, 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 a dress or whatever. Or and I wondered, do they talk this way of Michel Welbeck? Do they say he's bald? Or, uh, you know, and uh, this was in very serious newspapers. This was in Le Monde. It was not in uh, Gazia. And it's perfectly normal. And if you ask about it, you say, no, you were just described. But I don't care about being described. So it's a problem. And when I say nothing happens, I have the impression that. Uh, how can I say that? Um, difficult topics are constantly thrown to the feminists, like prostitution in France, the veil. They're thrown at feminists as if we, I say we because I consider myself a feminist, we have to, we only we have to discuss these things. And I would like, uh, I would prefer a feminist which, I don't know, 
who could be inclusive. Uh, but I don't know, I, I prefer to talk about the novel, but because I, I'm not so good about French politics. But <laughs> well, I'm a specialist. I mean, it's interesting too that I think there's a demand on um, female fiction writers about um, who their characters are based on. Yeah. And often with um, fiction that's written in first person, there's this assumption that the work is autobiographical. Right. Um, or if it's not autobiographical, there's a kind of onus of like, well, just having to explain well, who that is, where somehow uh, the male imagination is this fertile ground and there's not really that kind of um, association or demand put on, on male writers, I think, in the same way. And I wondered if that had happened a lot, a lot. Um, this was my third novel, and for years I've been trying to explain that the narrator wasn't me in France, that uh, no, it's not my life, and who cares if, you know, if it is, if it isn't, I don't know. But it's, um, I love fiction. I love fiction, but it's true that I love reality, and all my novels are based on uh, hugely documented facts, because what interests me is that mix of reality and fiction and the way that fiction can just have everything inside, even poetry or whatever. But it's true that when you're a woman writer and you write in the first person, uh, it seems totally normal to, to, to think that uh, it's my journal, you know. I can only talk about myself and I don't have imagination. I can't talk about the world because it's so big, you know, and I wouldn't understand it. And uh, I have to tell you, and then I will stop my bad French bashing, but I have to tell you one thing, that for La Petite Communiste, uh, the, the, the book um, I did about Nadia Komenich, but the remaining gymnast, um, I was on a very famous uh, cultural show, and the guy uh, greeted me like, I have to, to tell you something, it's a compliment, it could have been written by a man. <gasps> and it was live, so I just stared at him uh, in silence. <laughs> but this is the amount of... Um... That was the yardstick of right. excellence. <laughs> um, well, it was interesting to me that um, that in this book, in, in We Are the Birds, um, you chose as a kind of central event the Haymarket riots, um, and uh, and and to be frank, I had to. I mean, I kind of know what they are, but I I didn't feel like I I could trust what I knew about them to to go into reading this book and a conversation with you, and then it was it was so interesting to think about how, I, I'm curious how that entered into your imagination and, and why, and there are so many things about that I thought we could talk about. Actually, uh, I read a book about uh, an American anarchist feminist from the 19th century who was called Volterine de Clare. And she was called Volterine, uh, which is kind of strange, but because her father loved Voltaire. And when I read this biography, uh, I was amazed. I mean, most of the things she writes about uh, would be even, uh, I don't know, would be new even today. She wrote about marriage being uh, an unfair contract. She wrote about sex. She wrote about love. And she was amazing. And through her, uh, I arrived at the Haymarket because when the Haymarket uh, uh, story uh, happened in Chicago in the 19th century, she wrote about it, but at the beginning, she, I had to, maybe I have to read the part of the about, about the Haymarket because maybe you don't know. Because um, well, then uh, just to finish, Voltaire de Clare was like everyone convinced that uh, the anarchists had put the bombs, and then she understood she had been wrong, and she wrote about it all her life. She and that was really moving for me. She writes beautifully. So I decided to make her a character in a sense that this is the story of three women. Three women who are like uh, sleeping beauties. 
except that the charming prince is a charming princess, and it's the little girl down the lane who is obsessed with what Bertrand do can. So maybe I should read about the Hayden Perfect, even if you know, because uh, I'm sure some of you do. Okay, so May 1886, a general strike breaks out in several American cities. The strikers oppose the mechanization of labor, the exploitation of children, and demand an eight hour work day. 340,000 workers demonstrate in Chicago, joined by students and even laundry women. On May 3rd, August spies a young bookseller and editor at the Workers' Daily, addresses the crowd. At the end of the demonstration, striker breaker, sorry, strike breakers attack. Rocks fly and the police fire real bullets. They kill six strikers and wound hundreds of others. Horrified, spies rushes to write a revenge leaflet published in the newspapers alone. He calls for a peaceful gathering the next day on Haymarket Square. Thousands of workers, women and children, and even the mayor of Chicago, Carter Harrison, come to listen to Albert Parsons, an activist who also writes in the alarm, and Samuel Fielden and other spies who have been deeply involved in this movement for months. It begins to rain. People disperse. A police regiment suddenly appears, encircles the remaining demonstrators and declares the gathering illegal. Fielding hardly has time to finish his speech when the police charge. And no one knows where it's sprung from. But there is a terrible explosion, a bomb explodes. The police fire on the crowd. In a few minutes, seven policemen are dead and dozens of demonstrators. During the trial, the possibility that the police shot one another, since they were the only ones who were armed, is hardly mentioned. The very next day, the cops carry out a search, arrest, and interrogate hundreds of people suspected of being linked to the ringleaders. This is the beginning of a veritable hysteria, a witch hunt for anarchists. Even Vertilin Duclair is fooled and denounces the anarchist bomb throwers, but she soon realizes people were being manipulated. The Chicago Tribune of May 6 calls for the deportation to Europe and the extermination of the ungrateful Yenas, slave wolves and wild beasts. Meetings are attacked. Newspapers that sympathize with them are placed under surveillance. All the spies, George Engel, Adolf Fischer, Louis Lee, Michael Schwab, Oscar Neve, and Samuel Fielden are arrested and declared guilty of murder. Some of them were not even at the demonstration. Spies and Parson left very early. June 21st, in Cook County Criminal Court, the trial is the trial of anarchism. On the first day, Parsons, who had gone into hiding in Wisconsin, enters the courtroom and calmly sits in the dock near his friends. The prosecution, according to the judge's own words, is not based on their actual participation in the acts and acknowledges that the bomb thrower is probably not in the courtroom. But says the district attorney to the jury. The question you must answer is this. Did these men encourage, advise, support the bomb throwers with their writings and speeches? August 19, they are sentenced to death, except for Oscar Lee, not in Chicago in the day of the meeting. Sentenced nonetheless to 15 years in prison. Two others are sentenced to life. Louis Lee commits suicide in prison on November 10th, not giving the state the right to take his life. August spies George Engel, Adolf Fischer, and Albert Parsons are hanged on Friday, November 11th, a day called Black Friday ever since. Those who witnessed 
the execution, said that not one of them had his neck broken and their death by strangulation was slow and horrible. 250,000 people stand silently along the way to the cemetery and over 20,000 people march behind their coffins singing La Marseillaise. No one ever learned who threw the bomb. What is certain is that none of the accused could have done it. Who cares, you might say, but in 1893, after an investigation, the governor of Illinois pardoned the survivors and condemned the murderous bias of the trial procedure. Today in Paris, on May 1st, resigned crowds march along the customary route from Republic to Nation. The words they chant are merely pretenses of threats and combats. We will never retreat. We will never retreat. Sobs of rage choke me when I run into these gatherings circumscribed by policemen and garbage trucks, following them slowly, picking up and erasing the traces of a disorder that has not occurred. I found a photo in the well done cemetery in Chicago, a monument, a very solid stone holds them all there, historic character made inoffensive by forgetfulness. And these words engraved, the last words of August Spies, pronounced through the sheet covering his face at the moment the trap door opened beneath him. The time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. My silence is weak and lonely, Rodini. It's just a banal non-voice that nearly smothered me once, so with the help of what I've read and seen, I try to feed that silence, so it may at least turn into a hard mass, something resistant. It's them or us. P.S. The poem Vorderine Duclair wrote for the martyr August Spice begins with this sentence that is said to the judge during the trial. We are the birds of the coming storm. It's really beautiful. Um, Thank you. It's, I wanted to say that um, this story is, for me, is so interesting because it's so contemporary. It's so, uh, it's not getting old. I mean, it's, it's the story of people um, being condemned for what they might have said, but certainly for the ideas they had, because everyone knew they weren't here. So, I, I don't know, it's, it's so powerful for me, these stories. You know, it, it, it certainly made me think about public protest as a, as a means of change, and, and it does feel so circumscribed now, um, and, and it's interesting to be reminded of how circumscribed it, it, it has been uh, in the history of, of this country, for sure. Yeah, right. and, and I think this country should be proud to have been the country who gave birth to the unions and to, I mean, uh, you have such a terrific past, <laughs> terrific history, <laughs> and, uh, and all the the anarchist movements of the 19th century, all the wonderful writing that have been, and the feminism of the 19th century is uh, amazing. Uh, one should read for Devine Leclerc again because I don't know if she's published here because even in France it's a very small publishing. And if you find her. But I feel like there's also this failure too that that we are seeing now, you know, every week, every month, um, of public protests to really make, you know, kind of affect the kind of change that that we want. And um, um, of course, there are all kinds of reasons for that. But it does seem like um, some of it is that, um, well, it's been. Uh, uh, Largely associated with youth, and um, and I thought it was it was interesting to kind of imagine um, 
the Haymarket riots and this kind of movement to change, fundamentally change ideas about labor um, and not kind of associate that kind of movement building only yeah. with youth. Exactly, because uh, at the time in Chicago and, and a lot of other cities in America, um, they had some huge protests against children labor. I mean, can you imagine that they made that change? I mean, you know, uh, uh, and uh, it's true that when you read some some texts from the time, you see that there were uh, workers, there were laundrymen, there were from all over, and very often people would die. Very often, not only in the Haymarket, in every city they were being shot at. Uh, it was uh, it was quite dangerous. I mean, when you went there, you would you would uh, really uh, engage physically. I mean, but we did fail to um, to get our month off in August. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans made a huge error in, in stopping with the where we did. That's true. Yeah. Right? Um, and you, I've heard that you identify with anarchism, or that, I mean, to me that seems kind of more, so much more radical than saying you're a feminist, at least from an American perspective. It's uh, like, there are lots of feminists, <laughs> but there are not a lot of, of um, public figures who will say, oh, I, I, I'm an anarchist, or I, I'm thinking about that as, as a viable way of, of organizing. I think, um, well, you know, I spent my whole childhood in communist countries because I was living in Romania. I come from Romania originally, then I went in France. So uh, I've seen communism pretty close, and I know it failed, and I know it's... And, I, and I've seen capitalism arriving in France, and from my point of view, especially when it, it's about women, it's the, these are two powers, and it's like what we say in French, la peste et le coriard. For me, it's like two illnesses, and they don't work. Now we know. So uh, my interest in anarchism is maybe more intellectual, and maybe uh, about all the philosophers who explore uh, something else, who try to think that that's not all there is. I mean, that maybe we can imagine something else. Just the thought of being unsure. Uh, of uh, being, uh, uh, of accepting doubt for me is important. Because now uh, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it, sometimes it feels like uh, capitalism is uh, it's all there is. It's like you can't question it. But no, it's not true anymore. I mean, it, people in France, they, sometimes they, uh, we have unemployment, of course. Uh, you have people so unhappy when they work, some who don't, but some who work and so are so unhappy. So um, I think we should question all these systems and try something else. And as for women's bodies, uh, in Romania, for instance, Ceausescu, so the president, he decided at some point that women should have four or five children. It was, uh, you had to, you had no choice. So. Women's bodies was really detained by the state and the power. But at the same time, in capitalist countries, the woman, uh, the, the, their body is sold with a yogurt and with a car, or, and it's, uh, it makes women sick with despair to see themselves in images. Well, you know the thing, I, I don't have to tell you. And uh, everybody thinks it's so normal to have uh, a poison injected in your in your face, uh, I mean, you know, if you take some distance, it's, it's quite terrible. Uh, so, for me, these powers are wrong on women's bodies anyway. They try to control it always. And each of them has tried to, to, to make women, you know. Let's not even talk about religion. <laughs> um, I was thinking too about um, this this idea of um, influence um, that that in a way kind of 
revisioning history as you do kind of bringing up Haymarket um, uprisings and thinking about um, really how those um, structures of, of monumentalizing these these um, movements uh, in very particular ways, you know, can freeze those moments in time. Um, but also now, you know, it's talking about, you know, your interest in anarchism. I was thinking, you know, that um, uh, there's something about um, influence uh, from the past, from charismatic figures um, that um, I wondered what, you know, what, what you thought about influence, who you felt influenced by, um, as writers, or just, just at, for whatever that means for you, um, and what does it mean to be under the influence, how is that? It's very difficult to answer because I can be under the influence of a friend sometimes, you know, it's not always, uh, figures. Um, I, I I wouldn't know really what I'm influenced about. I, I guess I really like um, figures who who are not obvious, who uh, who have uh, a, a, a strange path. And I'm even with people, you know, I tend to like people who don't go straight. I mean, who just you know who have to to wander and who have to stop and who have to restart. And who, this is my main influence is not being sure all the time. And, uh, Would you talk a little bit about um, Nadia Komenice and the novel? The novel um, yes. Um, this will be published uh, here uh, next year, I think. Actually, um, your, your yes. American publisher is here, Dan Simon, in the audience. You're after that. Okay. You're after, you're after that. Okay, and uh, the translator is here also, so I'm, yes, and so I'm really honored and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, la petite communiste qui ne souriait jamais, which means the little communist who never smiled, uh, is not at all a biography. It's really a novel, and uh, it's, of course, it's based on Nadia Kalanich's life, because I, I did a lot of research, and obviously I can speak Romanian and read Romanian, so I had this opportunity to read French, Romanian, and English. But um, I, I wrote a novel uh, about her body, about a young girl, a little girl, whom the world falls in love with when she looks like a kid. She's 14 when she's in Montréal, but she looks like 10. And suddenly the journalists, at least in France, they fell in love with her, and what I read was I have to tell you the, the, the sports article were <laughs> really. I mean, uh, they were in love with a kid in a way that was very weird. And the backlash of that is that she was not supposed to grow up. And as soon as she becomes a woman, the hate of the same newspaper was terrible, the violence against the body. But, so that was my topic at the beginning. And uh, um, plus, uh, being able, as I had grown up there, to describe what was it like to live in Romania when you were a kid. And to question, uh, to question the, the obvious thoughts uh, about communism and capitalism, for example, when I came in France, kids would say to me, "Oh, that must have been terrible because you were, uh, you were um, under surveillance all the time." And I said, "So these are the people who put cameras in the street and who love that, and these are the people who have iPhones in their pockets and who love that. They are being followed everywhere too. So you know, sometimes you have to reconsider stuff." And I think communism was very, very, uh, how to say that, um, under surveillance. But we are too, you know. So it's a way of being a little, to take a little distance and to, to observe things differently. Because 
uh, things are complicated, they're not black and white. So that's what the novel is about, through Nadia's coming age story, of course. Can't wait to read it. Um, I did want to leave some time for questions, questions and interaction. Yes. Um, uh, we're going to hand you a mic. I found it interesting your comparisons between the world we live now and the new state of mania. And my question is whether you found, whether your observation is. Uh, as far as women's rights are concerned, that in communism, like Romania or maybe Yugoslavia or Hungary at that time, that women, did they have more or less rights, do you think, there than women in the capitalism and Western world? It's a very interesting question and I am... Um it's interesting because I never, when I when I talk in France about this novel, I'm always trying to be careful because I don't want people to think I'm defending uh, either way because I'm just trying to question. Uh, but what you say is interesting because I grew up as a kid with women in uh, authority jobs that I didn't see in France. I mean, in Romania, women were doctors, were engineers, were architects. They rode buses, and when I came to France, none of it. Was, the, was true, you know, and more than that also, I, there was no advertising, because we had nothing, but uh, nothing to advertise. So, but the thing is, when I came to France, suddenly, I was 12, and I was struck by the image of women naked to sell everything. It was very violent, and that didn't exist. So, you know, I can't tell you it was bad. It was... In certain ways, I think that women were more advanced. Thank you. I know it's strange, but... No, it's not to me. I grew up in Yugoslavia. I, I guess. And here, and I made similar observations. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting in your, yeah. in your experience with that. Thank you. Thank you, first of all. Um, the... You said something about Botox, and it made me think about, on one hand, um, one of the things that the women's movement and feminism has taught me is that, you know, I have a right to control my body, not yours. And then you have commodification of the body. Then you have all of the, why do, why do people do this? Um, and the pressures on men, women and also men to be something other than they are chronologically other than they are in their class. So I just want, from an anarchist point of view, I'd like to, to you to talk, and I'm not asking for, for an answer to the question, but just talk about this, what this means. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I totally agree with the, I'm, I mean, uh, do what you want with your body is tricky, you know, because it's not what you really want. It's what a society tells you to want, which is very different. Yeah. I mean, do what you want, of course, but I'm tired of this hate discourse of the magazines, the, the so-called women magazines. It's hate. When you read the, how do you call that, the, uh, okay, when you read the, the, the titles, are you have to repair something, you have to mend, you have to change. This is subtle hate. So, uh, what kind of a world is a world where, where women have a clear, and I don't know this word, you know what is written on yogurts when it's over? How do you call that? The date? Expiration. Right. For women's body. I mean, what kind of a world is that? When you have this thing for women. You know, so that's my answer. I don't know if it's... You know. child, which was 
uh, over 20 years ago, I gained weight. I also became older. I'm in midlife now, and it's, it's just been very hard to get the weight off. And I am perceived differently. And then French women don't get fat. Um, the, the writer tells the story of having been an exchange student in the United States when she was young, gaining weight because the, the culture around food is very different than the culture in France. And her father comes to greet her after she spends this year as a high school exchange student, and he says, May to te ressemble un sac de potat. And so I'm just wondering if you, if you can comment on that aspect of it, if there's the same kind of pressure in France to be a certain size, and there's something wrong with you if, if you're perceived as being overweight. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Uh, I guess it. Yeah, I, I guess it's the same all over. Um, I don't know if it's um, worse. Maybe it's worse in Paris than the rest of France. No, I think maybe it's worse. Um, and in fact, in the novel about Nadia Comaneci, um, I was very interested because at some point I hadn't seen all the videos and I looked at the press first of one of her comebacks when she's 15 and the press would say, oh, she was such a cow, oh, she was so fat and so terrible. And then I watched the video and I said, she was beautiful. She was, and she was, I wouldn't say normal because that doesn't mean a thing, but, uh, and, you know, it's very tricky because when I was writing, I was watching a lot of videos and I was watching Montréal, 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 like 10,000 times. And after a while of watching this kind of a very thin body, very muscular, I started to be accustomed to that. And then when I saw other gymnasts, I would say, ooh, they look uh, fat. You know, so it's very difficult. I, I, I noticed that, you know, that uh, this is what is presented as normal, as, as desirable. Or, so it's difficult to fight that, but I'm... I don't know, I read, um, when I was a teenager, I read a feminist uh, book from uh, the US, which, was, which made a great impression on me, but I don't know the title. And it said this thing, uh, which stayed with me. Imagine the number of hours you spend uh, thinking about diets, food. These are the hours where you don't do anything else, and when you don't do something that puts you as a an important person in society and it gets you out of certain games. Mm. This is such a powerful idea. Of course we can't leave thinking, oh, I shouldn't be thinking a little differently, but sometimes we should. Sometimes we should say, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it is this catastrophe, really, if you think about how much, how much time it's women amazing. spend trying to control something. Exactly, trying to and, be there, something that isn't wrong. Right, and it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to think about what all of that energy might go toward. Exactly, and, that um, is. I think is, you know, it's, uh, it's, and it's, and it's odd that, I mean, people, you know, I mean, we talk about this kind of resistance to these beauty um, uh, models, uh, but, but really, if you think about it in terms of time, and then in terms of power, social power, personal power, exactly. erotic capacity, all of that, it seems um, like, then it, it's hard not to kind of become conspiratorial. You know, exactly. kind of have what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like, it's a, when I feel a little bad, I feel it, it's like a conspiracy for me. You know, it's like, uh, okay, mind your butt and your... Uh, your pounds and your cottage cheese, and then when you're there, you don't do anything else, you know. But I mean, I'm not different. I'm not saying that it's uh, uh, easy, but it's something, uh, and it has never changed because uh, you know, in museums, uh, women are naked. They're painted by men as I don't know, since centuries, as uh, objects of desire who should 
look like this in 19th century, like this in 20th century, women don't represent themselves, not a lot. And I think that might be very different if we saw more of women artists, we should represent ourselves, because that would be very different. I think that's the key, I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad to hear that you are a fan of Balterine de Clare. Oh. She's a hero of mine too, and I've actually written about her, but more about her very good friend Emma Goldman, who was an anarchist and a feminist. And in fact, I just, in case you don't know this, at the, in the uh, late 1960s and the early 70s, there was a movement of anarcha feminists, and they were often associated together um, because they shared a lot of uh, ways of thinking, the leaderlessness, um, and that was a very strong part of the women's liberation movement here. And of course, both Walter and Claire and Emma Goldman struggled mightily for uh, birth control and for freedom to have children out of wedlock and in some ways to criticize marriage, although Emma Goldman and Voltaire de Clare were, uh, didn't agree about marriage. Um, Emma Goldman was much more judgmental about people, women marrying. She thought it was just rotten, whereas Voltaire uh, felt that women didn't have so much power that they could just leave their marriages. But anyway, um, there was that connection between the two. Uh, and it's wonderful to hear you put that connection together again. Thank so you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Alice Yes. Yes. Are you awesome? I was fascinated to hear, if, if I have correctly, that, that the Haymarket uh, demonstration afterwards they sang uh, La Marseillette, yep. since we're here. So I was interested in the origin of that. Because today I just read that um, America the Beautiful, which is sort of alternative national anthem here, the anarchist historian Howard Zinn, for example, he taught the North Vietnamese when it was that to sing America the Beautiful together with it. Um, but I imagine uh, La Marseillette wouldn't be sung perhaps in France in the labor movement, uh, it was in the international, and, uh, well, and, and uh, today it's more sung by <coughs> the National Front than by anarchists, certainly. Uh, so what, when did it stop in the US that they sang the last year? And many of these workers probably were more of Italian and Polish origin than French, and uh, what's the origin, and when did it stop? I'm really sorry because I'm not really a specialist, so I, I, I can't tell you how to say it. But I guess that uh, they said La Marseillaise because it was such a, because the revolution wasn't far and because there were a lot of European um, immigrants who came to, to America and uh, certainly some French, I don't know. But no, maybe not, maybe you're right and maybe it was a symbol and French wouldn't have done that. You know, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. But I have to check. No. <laughs> so, Lola? Yes. Just one final question. That's a sweeping question, but I wonder where you feel that women are today. There's a lot of talk about feminism and there's a lot of, there's a small handful of women CEOs in this country. Um, so this is an atmosphere as though there is great change, but I wonder where do you think the glass is half empty or half full? So I didn't get the Do you think the glass, um, okay, the yeah. phrase in, in yeah, English, yeah. is the glass half empty or half full? Are, we, are women actually making considerable progress. Has feminism really made a huge difference or is it through such knowledge, through the other uh, I wouldn't say for here because uh, I'm, I'm not familiar. I don't know what happens here, so I don't know. But, um, you know, there's a sentence from uh, a French 
author and feminist, Françoise Giroud, who said something which I really like. She said, uh, uh, the day where as many as incompetent women will be uh, at important places, uh, that will be the day feminism uh, will be, you know. And I think that's the answer. I mean, you know, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to say how much I enjoy knowing you and, you. I and enjoy reading you. your work and how lovely it's been to be here. Um, there are books and Lola will stay and sign copies and um, thank you all for Thank you for coming. coming.